Okay, we're about two minutes past the hour. I think we can go ahead and uh, maybe get started so we have enough time to do the, go, get through the material and have some room for questions toward the end. So uh, I will get started, make sure everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Jeff Rowe. I am the program manager for LF Energy and today is the seventh webinar in the series of the LF Energy webinar series going over each of our technical projects. So the, what we're talking about today is the Energy Market Methods Consortium, which is a group of, of uh, methods that are developed in, a, in collaboration that can then you be used to drive software. And uh, McGee will be going over this in detail. Uh, I just wanted to maybe talk a few minutes of, at first about how to operate within this webinar for uh, those of you who are new to it and also to maybe give a, a short overview of LF Energy with a few slides at the beginning. So as far as the webinar is concerned, all participants are able to raise their hands. There should be a button there to raise a hand if you need a hand, so to speak. And uh, I will be able to reach out to you through the chat function. And you can also find me directly through the chat function. Uh, if you have a specific question that you want to bring up, you can bring it up in the Q&A box, which you should be able to get to through the meeting controls. And uh, I'll be able to see it and either answer it or make sure that it gets flagged for McGee to answer later on in the webinar. And uh, other than that, I think we're just about it. This meeting is, this webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on the LF Energy website and on our YouTube channel later on this week. And we'll have the slides available as well. So uh, let's go ahead and get started talking about LF Energy. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. This is a diagram of the internet. It is uh, sort of a, a, a map of each of the nodes in the internet, I think from last year. And uh, as you can see, it looks very much like a, a neural net or a, uh, something that has grown organically. And it really has. And one of the basic principles of this network and of, of all resilient networks is that it has the ability to route around problems. It has the ability to, uh, to react to issues. And um, that's a very basic design principle for resiliency that does not really exist in the grid today as we know it. And so uh, LF Energy was founded upon the principle, go ahead and click to the next, that we need to leverage these same design principles that we have used to scale the internet from just a few dozen nodes as it was in the, in the 1980s to the many billion nodes monstrosity that we have today. And uh, the only way to do that is with software, thank you, to leverage the world's largest shared technology investment and that is the Linux ecosystem, the open source ecosystem. Uh, the mission of LF Energy is to create the grid of the future as, as composed of loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. Uh, to combine this with robust autom autom automation and the digitalization of energy. Uh, there's a lot of the energy grid worldwide now that is not digital and is not really uh, directly controllable with software. And we feel that the best way to approach that issue is through the open source process and using open source principles of transparency and inclusion in order to uh, promote that mission. I can go ahead and move to the next, please. Uh, there's a, certainly a need for safe, shared, safe and scalable code within the energy sector. Uh, and the, the fact is that most industries today do run primarily on open source modules, which is a very big, bold statement. Uh, it's very demonstrable. I, if you can, one of the things you can think of is just how many different systems there are, telecommunication systems between me talking uh, here on the West Coast of the United States and if you listening for wherever you are in the world. And uh, this communication is almost instantaneous, and yet it goes through 30 or 40 systems all of which are open source, all of which have opened code, which makes them more secure, more scalable, and more resilient. And indeed, it also supports business agility, preserves intellectual property, and uh, 
removes the competition for shared components that are not really profitable in the first place. It opens up opportunities to, to elaborate on a, a basis that everybody can build from the same place. Uh, next slide, please. So LF Energy uh, as an organization is sort of an umbrella and uh, underneath this umbrella, we have a number of different, we're addressing a number of different areas. Uh, one of which under flexibility is the open EE meter, uh, which was contributed by a company called Recurve, which I think McGee will probably talk about a bit. Uh, open EE meter uses methods that were developed in the EM2 process. There are a number of projects that address control room coordination, remote orchestration, planning, design, and simulation with po the possible project. We can also see uh, that uh, microgrids are addressed using the Reaps platform, which is a platform that is very flexible and uh, creates essentially the internet of energy things. Uh, there is a, an open data project called OEDI that is being run, uh, created, was created by the National Renewable Energy Labs and was contributed to LF Energy to create software around complex uh, assessment of many terabytes of open data. And we can also see in the gray areas that there's a lot of room for improvement and a lot of opportunity for energy to be addressed through open source projects. And that there are other projects that are in the process of forming right now. I'll move to the, our final slide. So this is the, these are the current LF Energy members. These are the founding members as of our software launch about a month ago. We are very pleased to have all of these organizations on board and all of these voices in the mix. And we encourage you to participate and put your voice into the mix as well. And with that, I will hand it over to McGee to talk to us about the Energy Market Methods Consortium. Thanks, Jeffro. Uh, can, you, can, can you hear me okay? Yep, absolutely perfect. All right, I'm gonna assume that everybody else can hear just fine as well. Um, it's great to, great to be on the webinar today. Um, and I appreciate uh, LF Energy providing us some time to talk about the Energy Markets Energy Market Methods Consortium, or EM2, as we've dubbed it. Um, I'm gonna go through a handful of slides that um, kind of take, take through a, an overview of uh, what EM2 is, um, why it matters, and, and kind of talk specifically about Caltrack, which has been the, the sort of vanguard of, of work under this uh, initiative. Um, how we see it fitting into LF Energy, uh, kind of the, the scope of what we're hoping to tackle with EM2, um, a little bit about, you know, sort of how it works. Uh, it's a little bit different um, in terms of what we do with EM2 relative to some of the other projects that Jeffro um, highlighted there in, in the beginning. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then obviously for folks who are on the call who are interested in participating, um, you know, we're encouraging um, as, as broad of a set of uh, stakeholders as, as we can. Uh, and then at, at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. So um, I'll try to run through the slides relatively quickly so that if folks do have uh, thoughts or, or questions, uh, we can address those at the end. And um, I'd like to just thank Carmen Best, uh, my colleague uh, who um, did a lot of the heavy lifting um, actually on this um, whole endeavor. Uh, so I'm merely here as a spokesperson. Um, Carmen really deserves most of the credit for um, putting together the EM2 coalition, working with uh, Jeffro to um, get everything underway, and um, also <laughs> the heavy lifting of, of putting these slides together. So, so thank you, Carmen. Um, so, um, so EM2 is, like I, like I mentioned, is, is a little bit different than, um, than the other projects in it. And it, as Jeffro mentioned, most of, you know, when we think about open source, we, we do think about open source code. Uh, so some, you know, computational infrastructure that allows us to perform complex operations that can um, be shared across, um, you know, different uh, users or different companies, different implementers, uh, that provides a, a basis for us to have a shared platform for performing similar kinds of tasks. And um, as, as, you know, Jeffro mentioned, this, this is very common in telecommunication and, compu and computing. Um, and much less common in energy. And there's you know, probably quite a few reasons behind that, which we don't really have time to get into today. Um, but EM2 is different uh, because it's not at all focused on code. Um, it's, it's, it's solving a different problem that we think open source actually is gonna be uh, 
critical in, in solving. But it's um, it's a problem that stems, you know, that goes way back to the earliest, um, you know, economies that emerged in this world, which is how much do I trust what you've said your product is? Um, and that trust can be something like how much does it weigh or how pure is it or, um, you know, how, how well was it packed? Uh, these, these kinds of core questions that are essential for a market um, have never really been solved for in much of the energy space. Um, we, we, know, we all know what a, what a kilowatt hour is or um, we have a pretty good idea of what a cubic foot of natural gas looks like and how that can be translated into a therm value. But for much of the energy sector, and in particular, you know, when we're thinking about energy efficiency, the guidelines for what constitutes a unit of production, a megawatt, as it were, um, have been much less, there's much less consensus around those types of, um, those types of products. And in order for markets to develop around those types of products, we felt like there was a need to achieve some level of consensus uh, within the broader community so that when we say that we've saved a kilowatt hour, that means the same thing from one implementation or one implementor uh, to the next. Um, so that's sort of the broad uh, motivation behind uh, EM2. Although as you'll see, there's a little bit more, even more complexity to it than that. So, um, so the way that we've kind of organized this, and this has been, um, the LF Energy has been really helpful in kind of thinking through uh, what, what the right type of organizational structure is. Um, there's a broad stakeholder group um, that comprises the Energy Market Methods Consortium. And the, govern the governance of this is being led by um, utilities and uh, private market uh, actors, implementers of utility programs typically, who are involved in a transaction around energy efficiency in a pay for performance context. And so these stakeholders who you know, have a real interest in um, you know, making sure that the, that the answer that they're getting, that the unit that's being transacted is consistent, um, are also the ones who are making sure that the governance, or who are responsible for the governance of the Energy Market Methods Consortium. Within that broad structure, we have three, uh, well, we have two active and one um, sort of in the, on, on the drawing board uh, subgroups that tackle particular challenges associated with energy market methods. And uh, I'll get into what we even we mean by methods in a second here, but so, so Caltrack uh, is a um, methodology for calculating avoided energy use for the purposes of making payments uh, to third-party implementers of, of energy efficiency projects. So we, we call them aggregators because they're typically aggregating a bunch of projects together and, um, and getting paid on the basis of that aggregation. Then the second uh, working group is developing methods and guidance for making savings claims. And in the world of energy efficiency, there's a there's sort of a big distinction between the payment that you might make to an aggregator or what you might be more familiar with is like a rebate payment to a customer on the one hand. Um, and then the way in which that, that payment, that savings gets claimed in a regulatory context. And so in a regulatory context, you have issues like uh, the lifetime value of those savings, the expected useful life of the measures that were, um, that were installed, or uh, the naturally occurring rate of savings in the population, um, or the effects of upstream programs. So all of these other factors need to be netted out in order to understand what the savings claim can be for a particular energy efficiency project. And that's really the work that GRID is, the, the second working group called GRID is focusing on. The, the third working group, which is still, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's in the works, um, is really tackling the question of data access and rules and, and around how you can get access to energy data that is private, that is belongs to either the utility or the customer or some combination of the two, and use that data for the purposes of making these types of calculations without violating the individual privacy rights of the 
owners of that data, which is to say, at the end of the day, the customers. Um, so these three working groups, we are kind of the core building blocks of what the Energy Market Methods Consortium is trying to um, develop uh, so that we can uh, facilitate more um, consistent, uh, transparent, and replicable transactions around energy efficiency to allow the market for energy efficiency as a resource to grow and contribute to the decarbonization of the grid. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of run through um, a little bit of Caltrack um, just to kind of give the folks on the phone who are on the call who are unfamiliar with this, you know, sort of a little bit of a background and a context for, for why this undertaking is, is important. Um, so, um, actually just gonna skip ahead to the next slide. This is my, this, this is my favorite slide. This, is, uh, this, this, this slide encapsulates the whole reason why, why we're trying to do this. So on the right is, is an energy uh, consumption uh, chart for a building. It looks like um, maybe a small, uh, small commercial building. Um, looking at you know somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 100 kilowatt hours per day of, of energy consumption. That's sort of going down over the course of a couple of years, um, but it's it's periodic. So in, so in the winter time, it's using a bit more than it is in the summertime. Now, for many folks who are you know unfamiliar with energy efficiency, that you know the, the kind of there's an assumption that gets made that we know how to calculate energy efficiency savings. The reality is that we don't know how to calculate energy efficiency savings because there is no like one way or one right way of doing it. And in fact, we, we did a little thought experiment with uh, this particular chart that uh, looked at different, you know, this, basically the same type of analysis done three different ways that got you three different, very different answers in terms of the, the savings calculation that would be made here. And for those of us, you know, I, I was new to, to this world about three years ago and had, you know, a similar sort of naivete about um, how the savings calculations were done. It seemed like weird that people would be talking about this so much, but then you realize that, that the execution of a savings calculation is a pretty complicated set of processes. It requires you know, assumptions about the quality of the data and about characteristics of the building that if they're not documented, and not specified can lead to widely variant uh, conclusions about the effects of a particular intervention on a building's energy consumption. And so if, if you're setting up a market, I mean, think about going to a gas station and pumping gas, and the amount of gas that you put in your car is dependent on the person who set the gas pump, you know, <laughs> Uh, settings, right? You wouldn't know if you're putting in 10 gallons or 13 gallons. Um, that would be, you know, sort of hard, uh, and and you wouldn't know how much you were getting charged uh, at the until after the fact, uh, until after you put your gas in. They said, "Oh, turns out that was 13 gallons, so it's going to cost you more." That's kind of how it works with energy efficiency now. Um, is that you do a bunch of work, and depending on who's doing the measuring, that's how much you get credit for, and. That's really problematic from a market standpoint because you really can't make investments into assets and resources with that type of uncertainty. If you don't know what your return on your investment will be until after the fact and if it's, de and if it's uh, dependent on who's doing the measuring. So, uh, so we worked with the California Public Utilities Commission and uh, Pacific Gas and Electric uh, to develop a standardized set of methods that would be uh, applicable to um, residential buildings, uh, small, small and medium-sized commercial buildings, and depending on, on the nature of the, the, the building, maybe even some larger commercial buildings. When you get into, into buildings that are doing uh, industrial processes, uh, these are you know, a little trickier to try to have a consistent standardized method for calculating savings. And so we've sort of uh, hived off this Caltrack approach to the types of buildings that are generally um, affected by changes, their energy consumption is generally um, affected by changes in weather conditions. So there's a fairly strong relationship between outdoor temperature and energy use in the building that we can use to project a counterfactual. So how much, 
how much energy would a would a building consume if it if it hadn't have had the intervention done is is sort of the the key question, and um, so this turned out to be pretty hard. Uh, actually, it took it took about five years of work uh, to get the um, consensus around industry stakeholders that this methodology and we're not doing anything new. Really, just codifying best practices uh, that have been developed over the years, but um, but really empirically testing all of the um, little decisions that get made along the way in, in figuring out energy savings. I'll give I'll give an example um, that uh, kind of illuminates some of the complexity. So, if for example you're trying to figure out when an energy when a building's energy use is going to go up. Uh, not all buildings start increasing their energy usage uh, at the same outdoor temperature. Some buildings have better insulation than others, so their energy use only starts to go up as, a, as the temperatures are more extreme versus less extreme. And you have to go individually in each building, uh, test uh, for each individual temperature increment when the building starts increasing its usage. And that testing process requires a regression analysis. And so if you don't quite specify, that, for example, the limits of the temperature ranges that you're gonna uh, test against or uh, the significance of the relationship between temperature and energy that you're gonna count uh, as legitimate, then you can get quite different results from one, uh, from testing the same building in two different, in two different ways. And so uh, identifying what these key decisions were and then specifying them in a uh, formal process. Uh, so, you know, um, developing actual methods that would be followed and would be, uh, you know, documented as having been followed or not followed, but documenting when you're, when you're not following those methods becomes critical for the validity of a savings calculation. So you get the, the same answer using the same data if you follow the Caltrack method specifically, but you get a different answer if you don't follow those methods. And so making sure that if you say, we are following these methods, um, allows you to have confidence in the savings number that gets outputted. It, it no longer are you worried about when you're filling up your tank, if you're actually getting 10 gallons or not, because you know that everybody's following the same rules for calibrating your calculation. So, um, so over, over time, then you, you, know, you, you don't get it right on the first try. Uh, so there's lots of uh, you know, sort of open questions that, that emerge. Like for example, if I, if I started out by looking at monthly billing data or looking at uh, daily, even daily data, uh, I'm gonna use a particular set of, of techniques. But if I all of a sudden have access to 15 minute or hourly interval data, would I do anything differently with my savings calculation given the granularity of that data? And it turns out there's quite a bit more that you can do when you have hourly data versus daily or monthly billing data. So those, uh, so what we've done with Caltrack is we've sort of versioned it into, um, in, well, now we're up to version, we're working on version 3.0 uh, that allows the these methods to be continuously improved and refined and explicitly updated uh, to reflect innovations in the field. Uh, so, um, so we figured out, for example, that the hourly methods uh, can be deployed uh, in, a, in a different way than the daily and billing uh, methods. So those get a, a, a separate specification within the methods. Uh, we figured out how to aggregate uncertainty within portfolios. Uh, so that gets a separate section in the methods we also have figured out that you know, there are boundaries to what Caltrack can do. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out what are the eligible buildings for uh, this type of savings calculation versus ineligible. Um, so we're in the process now of Caltrack 3.0, and this is, um, we're again, sort of looking at opportunities to improve the performance of the models by addressing issues like a lot. So in, in natural gas consumption data, for example, there's a lack of sensitivity uh, to subtle changes in temperature um, around the, the balance point. So just when it's like fall or spring and people are kind of using their natural gas and kind of not, it's really hard to figure out where that sensitivity is in a building. 
So we're looking at ways of improving our ability to model natural gas usage to get more precise results um, out of the savings calculation. For those of you that are, that are sort of uh, interested in this, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but this is kind of the, the key concept behind uh, what it looks like to do a savings calculation in, in a building where you uh, create a model of the relationship between temperature and energy use and use that to project forward to um, the, the weather conditions of a, of a reporting period uh, after you've done uh, a, a retrofit and allows you to, to create this counterfactual of what would the energy use have looked like if we hadn't have done the project and compare it to what was the actual energy use in the building during that period of time. And that gives you a savings calculation that, that can be uh, transparent, replicable, and trusted by markets. Um, similar to that uh, core idea uh, is the uh, hourly method, uh, which is a little bit of a different um, statistical approach, but nonetheless captures some really interesting additional value. And, and one of the things that we're particularly interested in this is that uh, whereas energy efficiency that uses monthly or daily interval data can be useful for understanding sort of annual trends or even you know, over the course of a month uh, when energy is being used more or less. But when we get into hourly data, uh, this is where energy efficiency starts to become a real grid resource that we can actually uh, understand the impact of energy efficiency interventions on an hour by hour basis. So that as we're looking at grid congestion and production of renewables like solar and in California where we're ex experiencing what we call the duck curve where energy use ramps up significantly in the late afternoon hours, we can actually target energy efficiency projects whose effects are felt most acutely at those high demand times of day. So for example, if you're looking at say, the warmer parts of California, we could take Fresno as an example, where it's really hot in the summertime and everybody gets off work and goes home and cranks up their air conditioner. That creates a tremendous amount of stress on the grid, requires us to keep our um, power plants idling during the course of the day so they can ramp up sufficiently to meet demand during that time. It's a very dirty, heavy, heavy carbon uh, time of day. But if we invest in better insulation, air conditioning, solar panels, and pre-cooling of our buildings, we can significantly reduce the demand on the grid during that peak duck curve time of day. The energy efficiency really matters for places like Fresno when it's hot out in the late afternoon. By contrast, uh, in places like San Francisco and Open, where it really doesn't get all that hot, we, we, when we invest in ener energy efficiency in commercial buildings where they're using energy during the middle part of the day when our solar production is already over capacity in many, in many cases, we actually aren't doing anything to save carbon uh, during that time of day. And it may not be the best use of public resources if we're trying to decarbonize the grid to invest in heavily in energy efficiency that's happening uh, during the wrong time of day. So this is what the hourly savings values allow us to do, is to really kind of understand energy efficiency as a resource. There's some other interesting kinds of um, uh, derivative statistics that can come out of uh, thinking about energy efficiency from a statistical point of view. Uh, one of which is, uh, is to reimagine energy efficiency as not just something that happens in one particular building that's isolated from everything else, but it's actually happening in a bunch of buildings, all of which are connected to the grid. And so similar to how we might think about insurance, where we have a whole pool of insured, of an insured population that allows us to be pretty confident in the likelihood of any one member of that population experiencing an insurance event, uh, we can have a similar kind of a way of thinking about energy efficiency as a portfolio of projects that deliver consistent time and locational value to the grid. What we need to know then though is how much confidence can we have in those grid savings and how many projects do we need to bundle together in order to produce the savings that we need. You certainly don't want to underpredict, you know, the 
contribution of energy efficiency to the grid and have the power go out because you haven't adequately resourced it. So what we've done from a statistical standpoint is actually look at the underlying characteristics of the buildings and the depth of the savings that are being promised and figured out uh, the extent to which you need to build a larger and larger portfolio to deliver the grid value that you're claiming that you're gonna be able to, to deliver. And this is now, again, part of the emerging policy around pay for performance that you need to have portfolios of significant size, significant enough size to be confident in the savings that are resulting. But of, of course, you know, we can't, we can't uh, treat all buildings uh, this way for a couple of reasons. So if you think about buildings whose energy signature is, is unrelated to weather, and if you're using weather to try to predict what the energy usage might be, um, it's not gonna work very well. So if you have an agricultural water pump, for example, that comes on you know, sort of periodically, but not because it's hot out necessarily, but because the water level tends to be low or the government hasn't turned on the, uh, the central irrigation canals yet or for whatever reason, um, you're gonna have a pretty poor prediction. Or with schools, if you're using monthly billing data that's correlated with weather, the, the hottest time of year school is out and they're gonna be using less energy during that time of year. So, so to some extent, uh, these types of models are, are not super helpful for those kinds of buildings. On the other hand, you also have large industrial buildings, uh, hospitals, things like that, that um, if you go in and replace the, replace the light bulbs in a hospital, it's such a trivial amount of the energy use that is being consumed in a hospital that it's just not gonna show up. And so for those types of buildings, if there is a consistent pattern of energy usage, um, you, you, know, you might need to submeter or um, have it, take a different approach to, to calculating the savings in, in those types of buildings. But for everything else, uh, this includes most commercial buildings, uh, most residential buildings, uh, using this, um, this approach of calculating savings uh, that we've developed, uh, that we've sort of codified through Caltrack, ends up working out really well. And at the end of the day, um, this is a, you know, kind of a slide that um, only, only a data scientist could really love, but it gives you kind of an example of what, uh, what this level of specificity that ends up being required for compliance with this type of savings calculation. And this is why this needs to be open source, because everybody has to be able to look at this, be able to build their own implementations of of this methodology uh, so that they can participate in the market and not feel like, number one, that they have to pay some proprietary vendor in order to get access to savings data, or number two, that they can replicate the savings calculations that are being made by a third party. So if I'm getting paid on a savings calculation that's being made by a utility, I wanna be able to replicate that savings calculation to be confident, to know that they're that they're giving me the right answer, uh, that we, we should be able to come up, we should be able to agree on the savings value if we both utilize these methods. Uh, this is also, just to kind of go back real, really quick, um, Jeffro mentioned the open EE meter. So what we've done uh, at Recurve is um, not only been, you know, kind of uh, instrumental in developing these methods, but we've also developed an open source implementation of these methods, which you can, um, so, so the open EE meter, one of the services that it performs is a calculation of savings according to the Caltrack methods with documentation of how each step in the code, which is it's an open source Python module, each step in the code can be referenced back to the methods that have been defined uh, via Caltrack so that you can know as you're implementing the open EE meter that you're satisfying Caltrack requirements. Um, so I'm gonna so so that's that's Caltrack and, and I'll run through a little bit of the rest of the EM2 here. So sort of thinking about grid, um, these are like I said, you know, kind of the second secondary questions that get asked typically by regulators of how do we know if if the savings calculations that you're calculating at a, at a kind of a gross level are are actually being felt by the grid itself? Uh, so maybe they would have happened anyway. Uh, maybe you know you're you're putting in a and air conditioning in somebody's house, uh, but they've also done some, some energy efficient lights uh, independent of, your, of the air conditioning project that you did. So how do we back out the effects, the effects of other technologies that might be naturally being adopted by customers 
so that you're not double counting them. And uh, how long will these measures, the savings that you're measuring last? Do we, uh, can we project that into the future to give maybe a 10 or 15, give credit for maybe 10 or 15 years of savings uh, without having to measure uh, those savings for 10 or 15 years because of all of the um, exigent uh, circumstances that might arise you know, over the course of the next decade. You might have uh, turnovers in a tenancy in a commercial building or a homeowner might move out or they might have a kid. And so if we're really trying to think about the lifetime value of, of a measure, uh, what are the kinds of things that we can do to give full credit uh, for the great impact that they might have? Um, and then the, the, the third um, working group under the EM2 consortium is, is uh, what, what is you know, awkwardly called SEAT, uh, which is the Secure Energy Algorithm Testbed, uh, which is an appropriately muddy way to describe a concept that we've been working on for quite a while, which is um, that you know, success in an energy market requires access to energy data, but that energy data is fundamentally, you know, private. And the last thing that we want is to threaten decarbonization of the grid uh, by, so we need to be able to decarbonize the grid. We need to have access to data in order to, to do that, but we can't allow third parties to take advantage of that access to that data and use it um, to violate the, the privacy of individual building owners or homeowners or businesses. And so one, one example of, of, of this is uh, the need to know, you know what, are the, what are the broad changes that are happening in amongst non-participants, right? So people who aren't taking advantage of, who aren't being treated for an energy efficiency project um, might also be having light bulbs replaced. And this is how you would back out the effects of light bulbs, for example, from a treated group is that you look at what non-treated people are doing. So those non-treated people haven't given permission to look at their data to know how their energy use is changing. And so what SEAT is trying to do is figure out a way to allow access to that type of data without exposing who and what types of buildings you are that you're looking at. And then to write rules around that so that uh, policymakers can broadly adopt those privacy rules to better serve the needs of emerging markets. Um, so why does this matter, right? So, you know, this is a lot of work and a lot of complexity and, and you know, at the end of the day, what are, what are we gonna get out of this? And the reason that Recurve is really, in, you know, invested in, in all of these processes and, and, the, and the mission of, of LF Energy uh, in particular is that um, we fundamentally believe that grid decarbonization can't happen in the absence of private investment. That there, you know, we just don't have enough money as, a, as public entities to do all of the work that needs to get done uh, to increase the energy efficiency in our buildings and to build uh, resilience uh, in our communities and incorporate uh, renewable uh, resources alongside traditional resources and phase out um, all of our greenhouse uh, gas emitting uh, fuel fuel sources so that ha so there has to be some there has to be private investment into our building stock into our existing building stock uh, that leverages energy efficiency as a central tenant of that investment and in order to do that, we need to have consistent weights and measures so that we can transact that energy efficiency. It's worth something. Um, but if we don't know what it is, we can never know what it's worth. Um, so as we build tools like the Open EE Meter, and as we bring consensus uh, amongst you know, our stakeholders of our utilities, our regulators, and our private companies, it gives us that confidence that we need to build and invest in energy efficiency um, across um, all of our markets um, in a consistent uh, and transparent fashion. So, um, so thinking about how these how these tie together a little bit, um, you know, we've um, set up EM2 and Caltrack and Grid as a way to define kind of the rules. It's like the the constitution, if you will, and then. Um, 
what we need though are folks you know who are who want to put that, that the broad constitution into a book of laws right that actually implement the broad guidance uh, that's being um, generated through this consensus process so we started with the open EE meter and you know we're excited about the degree to which the open EE meter is being adopted by a variety of different stakeholders we, we did a, a webinar on this uh, last week to describe you know the work that goes on there uh, but we need more of it, uh, right? We need to continue to develop the tools that can implement the consensus agreements that are reached amongst our, our stakeholders. So with, with respect to EM2 in particular, um, as I mentioned at, at the outset, um, there's a steering committee that's uh, comprised of uh, the utilities and um, what we call aggregators who are either paying for energy efficiency through these methods or being paid on uh, energy efficiency, being paid for their energy efficiency deliverables and using these methods. But then there's working groups. The three working groups are comprised of a much broader group of stakeholders. And each of these working groups meets monthly, uh, develops issues uh, to research and to, to, to uh, build guidance around. And, and at the end of you know, a cycle of work, uh, submits these issues to the steering committee uh, for approval under EM2. So this is allows, allows for a diversity of voices to contribute to developing standards around the most critical pieces of our energy efficiency infrastructure that can then be approved by stakeholders who have the most at stake uh, with respect to these, um, to these issues and then can serve as the basis for development of code and um, op other or open source modules that can serve as implementations of this guidance. So, um, I'm not gonna get into too much detail on this, but um, for those of you who are, who are on the call who are not EM2 uh, members, um, we'd love to have your, your participation. Uh, this, is, you know, this is only successful when the community comes together and, and you know, works together to develop standards that can be broadly applied and, and reduce uncertainty for all participants. So um, I'm happy to follow up with anybody um, who is interested in becoming part of the steering committee. Obviously, uh, Carmen uh, has been working a lot on this and Bruce Mast is serving as the temporary executive, the interim executive director of the EM2 uh, group. Uh, and so obviously Bruce would be a good person to, um, to talk to as well. So uh, I think the slides will be shared, so I won't uh, go into much detail on this, but there's, uh, we've provided some links here to Caltrack, as well as to the Energy Market Methods homepage, uh, so folks can find out more about that. Um, right now, we're looking at roughly five uh, uh, issues in Caltrack that are that have been you know, out of about fifteen that were initially floated um, for Caltrack three point zero. Um, we're, so we're starting the, the the work of of researching and and um, digging into those issues. A grid is is looking at maybe three three or so kind of a little bit more broad issues because grid is a little bit newer than Caltrack, so uh, still kind of getting their feet uh, underneath them, and and uh, we're expecting big things out of seat. Uh, so I think we might have a um, a kickoff meeting towards the end of the summer with with seat. Uh, so that's uh, that's the presentation. Um, we've got about fifteen minutes here, so I'd be happy to open up to any questions. Um, Jeffro, I don't know how you want to handle the questions if we just want to sort of let, we don't have too many people on the call, so we could just open everybody up to, to, uh, to offer voice questions. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I can do that uh, individually here. Give me just a moment. All right, everybody has the ability to unmute themselves now to talk. Or feel free to type in a question into the Q&A box if you'd rather do that. Hey, Mickey, it's Mark from Energy Coalition. Hey, Mark. Hey, so what do you recommend for things like schools? I know that you've done a lot of Prop 39 and, and things like that, but so what would be the pathway there for measure? 
Yeah, great, great question. Um, so one of the one of the really great things that came out of the hourly methods work uh, was that um, we introduced a, a, a technique for um, for that that creates a proxy for occupancy. Uh, I won't get into the details of the statistical work that goes into that, but it allows you when you're when you're dealing with hourly data to um, to identify whether or not a building tends to be occupied or tends to be unoccupied for any particular hour of the day, for any particular day of the week, for any particular month of the year. And so for schools, especially since they have pretty consistent occupancy patterns, um, that allows, if you, if you have hourly data, then you can back out, you essentially run two sets of, of, uh, of equations uh, on the school depending on whether it's an occupied time or an unoccupied time, and then calculate the savings from there. If you're dealing with monthly or daily data, um, monthly is tough <laughs> for sure, um, because you only have 12 data points, but, but daily data, um, you know, it's, you just have to do a little bit more processing and, and some non, some custom, some custom methods uh, that are not sort of Caltrack methods uh, in order to, sort of figure out, you, you sort of assume that, you know, during these days of the week and during these months of the year, the school is not in session. But with hourly data, you can do it completely within Caltrack, um, you know, sort of certified methods. We had one question come up also from Ken Delaney about which companies are currently involved in EM2. And I was able to send the uh, stakeholders list for Caltrack, but you might, I don't know if you want to, if you want to talk about how companies get involved with it. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you had that at your fingertips there, <laughs> Jeffro, because I was like, oh, great. I don't know if I know them all off the top of my head. Um, but generally it's, it's a, it's a mix of, of utilities. Uh, so, you know, we've had, um, I think PG&E um, or similar similar to that, like the Energy Trust of Oregon, uh, NYSERDA uh, have joined um, Bayran, uh, or I'm not sure exactly the organizational entity there um, that joined, but um, those who are really um, leading the pay for performance, you know, side from the utility side, um, are joining and then implementers uh, who are you know getting paid on uh, pay for performance are certainly uh, joining and then there's sort of a range of other participants so it uh, includes um, MNV you know companies you know the, the companies that that perform savings calculations um, energy consultants. Uh, kind of a wide range. It's basically sort of anybody, you know, it's great because it's anybody who's sort of interested in this sort of thing is, you know, welcome to join and contribute and participate. Um, so it really is kind of an eclectic group. Sounds good. Okay, as we wind up, we have any other questions here in the last few minutes? It's also possible to, uh, to follow up with us directly. Uh, certainly there are uh, the mailing lists through the lfenergy.org website. You can go to lists.lfenergy.org and click on subgroups to see all of the different subgroup mailing lists within LF Energy. And, uh, and to uh, talk to the EM2 folks directly by going to the EM2 website, as was listed earlier. It's energymarketmethods.org. And so um, if nobody has any further questions, I think maybe we can just go ahead and wrap up and give everybody a few minutes back. So right. thank you very much, McGee, for a great discussion. Yeah, thanks for having us. And thanks for the folks on the line for sticking with it. Sounds good. All right, everybody, have a great day, and thanks for joining this webinar.